thanks for joining. This is uh, like our once a year look at the the numbers uh, from 2023. It's also like a key moment in that we are, you know, right at the end of the first month of Q1. And uh, from our client's point of view, we can look forward into their sales pipelines and cash flow, and even kind of look at like, hey, we think we know how Q1 is going to finish at this point. Um, we're all, we're obviously building towards that or encouraging people to kind of think that way. So as we look back a little bit um, what the numbers are, I can understand the position people are in and then be able to look forward with it. So that's what we're going to be able to cover today. My goal here today is to be able to give you an understanding of what 24 could be for you and some strategy, some thoughts of how to build right now so that we're not stuck too late in the year with a problem. Um, and as you can imagine, it's not all good news. So I don't want to, I don't want to leave you guys with a cliffhanger. Some of it's, um, it's going to be some hard work this year, but before we get too started too far into it, I just want to say, Hey, welcome. This is the weekly briefing. This once a week time where we get to see each other's faces, have a conversation and, and figure out what's going on in our industry. Many of the conversations that we have on this in this time come from you from our platform, Rev Community, from conversations that we had, like last week in New York City. Lewis, I say hi to you as part of those people. Um, and just the thoughts of like what we're doing on a week by week basis. So thanks for being part of this and, and keeping this conversation going. Before we get too far into this conversation, I do wanna point out one thing that we are doing um, right now also um, is in our community, you can see at the very top uh, there, there's this is today is the deadline for our annual industry survey. This is a service we do for many of you where we get to um, look at the um, how you would compare to other people, other peers in industry doing the same work as you. So we we get into some detailed questions of who you are, what your company does, and so on. Um, but it's just a type form. We gather that together and we'll give you a report. The idea is like you contribute, we'll give you the same information back. All of it would be confidential, so no one's going to see the exact who, what the companies are, any details about you. But the more, the merrier. Kind of gives us a big, um, big trends there. So if you haven't filled this out yet, it's right here at the top of community and discussion. Fill out that annual creative studio survey. Give us that information, and in response, as a favor, we'll give you back a report that lets you know how you compare to others. It's just a really great way to get out of your own like thought bubbles there. And wonder how it, how it's going out there. Are you are are you the only one? And who else is like you? What, how you compare up to that? So, um, and that's, that's how we can pull together community. surveys like this, isn't it, Tim? Like it's this sort of rich data that actually gives us industry specific information, which you just can't get anywhere else. Yeah, it's great. You know, I think we sit in a very unique place. I think where we get it. We have a lot of people who we process and talk to um, on a week by week basis. We are constantly looking at the data through our cash flow or our roll up or things that we're doing in production pipeline. And the comparison to me always gives us the sense of like looking backwards the rear view mirror, but also just looking ahead. And really, if you know anything about the RevThink systems, we're always projecting forward, trying to solve future problems so they actually don't become real problems on our doorstep. Um, so we are using data for that. Uh, and also obviously communication, what have you. So, um, Going across all the RevThink clients, um, we're able to look at some of these metrics this way. So you guys want to jump in? You want to see some of the stuff we're seeing? Yeah, here? yeah. This is uh, where the rubber hits the road a little bit. Um, wh what we do is, um, just for the for a record of knowing where we get this, we take the, the total debt impact that we have and we aggregate it. So there are clearly different industries represented here, companies at different sizes that we have to kind of put into a system. But we've we've studied our economics. We know how to put the pieces together to represent a clear picture for each of you, just like the global look at things. Each of you might be having different experiences at different times, and we appreciate that. But still, we think that if you know what other, what's going on with others, it helps you plan and build and grow yourself. So um, that's what we're doing here. And we look at some key items of this to um, key factors um, of, of our, of the accounts, just to see how things are going overall, overall assets. So that's bank accounts, accounts receivable, and therefore the total assets. 
as well as accounts payable, credit cards, and therefore total liabilities. And we're kind of looking at these numbers of like a bottom line. What does it look like for you and how does this stuff play itself out? So you can see we, some of the mega surprise. Were we surprised by any of this, Tim? You know, I think what I, I have had a bias a little bit knowing that end of year tax planning I did for so many and what it took to pay those taxes that we were going to see a dip in cash like we're seeing here. Um, but I'm going to, sh I'll show you in a, in a minute what I think. Um, I, I'll show you what I was unexpecting in a minute here of just how this thing's put together. And specifically, I was more optimistic about early 2024 and what I'm seeing now. I'm kind of give you a totally different strategy um, about how to look at it. Um, so let's just talk about this right here. This is, this is the big one for me. It's so obvious that we can see what happened. This is bank accounts, meaning what people have cash on hand. And three year look back from 2021 to 2023, we all know 2023 took a dive. And this is why, like we started using all that money we had. So many of you had cash reserves and we knew early on the year, maybe it was a bad season, maybe it was a bad quarter. So we took, took our money out of our accounts and we started spending it to get production done, keep the team around and so on. And that early year spend really dropped people's savings or like retention of cash to a, to a major three-year low. What often happens here when you are down on cash is you make very different decisions about how aggressive you can be in sales. So then we start focusing on short-term sales instead of long-term sales because we can't retain, we don't have enough in the coffer in the just-in-case category. And that decision points we start making start playing itself out to bigger mega trends. So if you realize like that one big hit just slowly starts depleting itself and we start thinking differently, but also it's not all our fault that the industry couldn't support it. Here's how this plays out next. So we have accounts receivable in addition to that. So why are we down with cash? Well, because we didn't get the jobs. AR is jobs that get awarded to us. They owe us money. We have accounts receivable. When the accounts receivable drops like this, it means the job awards dropped. Like the whole industry kind of like felt this big dip here. Now, once it hit the bottom, it did kind of have a little bit of a flat line. And then I think many of us know that the end of last year, which gave us some hope for 2024, was picking up. And we were able to take advantage of like a little bit warmer season than we spent in the first half of the year. Our desire is to have this keep going in 2024. And we'll show you what um, how that plays out. But here's the way that that feeling you've had, here's how it looks on a curve. Just the project disappeared. However, you see like the big drop in cash that the cash and AR are balancing each other out. Meaning that what we didn't get from our clients, we were using from our cash reserve to make, an, um, um, make up for it. And we really have this like flat line curve of assets. So that's where we are right now is like low assets, low cash on hand. But look at this, where did the money actually go? So if we had more revenue here, like they had a big revenue increase here, but there's nothing showing there's no increase on this black line. Where did the money go? It went here. Throughout the year, we basically collected accounts payable. So we owed people money and we had like we were, they were, it wasn't ever going away. So near the end of the year, most likely because of tax planning and advice, many people pay off that accounts payable and that drops that cash down even further. So now we basically, whatever late gains we could have had in Q4, we basically spent it on the IOUs from accounts payable. Very understandable, right? We're in a creative economy. Um, we owe people money. We want our reputations to be strong. We finally have the, some money back from earlier in the year. So we're going to make up for that time. And that's what we have right now. So the accounts payable dropped. That's a, usually a very good sign because we're catching up. But we have to be able to make up for this early, this drop right here, early in January in order to keep that going. Or maybe in February, or at least Q1, you know, that, hey, if I get rid of the money at the end of December, somewhere in quarter one, I'll be able to get my, my base back up here because I depleted that. So that's what we're going to be looking at for many of you in the, in the next quarter is, hey, how are the trends going? Right now, um, there's more happening in the industry and more disruption in the industry than not. 
and the projects don't seem to be coming into play. The, a lot of us are living on some debt here that we don't usually like. It's different when you have a really good sales cycle and you have high credit cards. This, these are credit cards related to project expenses, and we can replenish and work that out. But to have the revenue drop and credit cards increase, that's a that's an inverted curve. There, we're gonna we're, we have a we have a problem here that our the curve is going up, and at the moment where we have cash going down. This is what the economy is doing. This is the plan of the economy is to say, let's get rid of some of this, this easy credit and this easy debt and make people pay more for it so they stop spending and to slow down the economy, to slow down inflation or what the mega trend is. And we can see it. Our first initial reaction is that we go to the cheapest place to get it or the easiest place to get it, which is a credit card, opposed to like a long-term debt or what we should all be doing, our grandparents taught us, be only using cash. So we did have this kind of buildup of liabilities and of course the catch up there. That's the, on the cash side. I think that's just a one first view. I want everyone to have a kind of a sense of what's happening here and maybe how you feel is, hey, my cash reserves are depleted. And now I'm in Q1, I need to make very different decisions. And my stress right now probably feels the most in sales. Where is this money going to come from? How do I make it up? I need to find new places to get money because the usual places that were around for a few years, they all have gone away. So that's the first step. How do I do, Matt? Anything you need to I'm, catch up on? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm living that story right now. I totally, it, uh, it plays to all the experience I'm seeing around me. And it certainly does make you think differently about sales because it's not about trying to sell to everybody right now. It's really trying about Know, know who you're selling to. Yeah, the I with, without a doubt, like I called, I must have called eight salespeople I knew just last week alone when I started getting these numbers in and asking what made the difference. Now, there are a couple of anomalies. There's a really uh, interesting two different uh, meetings I had last week where the, the studio itself had a million dollar month. And this is an unusual act for them. So why would their, how do they triple their revenue in one month where most of us are kind of feeling like this pressure, they had something else that showed up. Um, and it was interesting to talk to those business owners to begin with, where did this come from? How soon did you see it coming? And they, they said, honestly, we're somewhat surprised. Like we knew we could see some of the stuff in their sales pipeline and we got the first project awarded. But then there's a moment where the, where the client says, well, now that you're doing one, here's two more or triple what we would have usually given you. And my belief there is that the shift that we're all feeling and seeing, our clients are seeing it too. And right now in a world that's complicated, some of these clients that we're having are going to be laid off themselves. Paramount's being absorbed or cutbacks in tech. They're not feeling confident that they're going to have a job always. So they're trying to keep it simple. So they say, well, you know what? I already gave you one big project. If you can handle it, can you do all of it? It makes my life easier and maybe, you know, keeps you around and keeps you stable. So there's these key, we'll call them unicorns, are getting some return on this relationship investment they've made for a very long time. And that relational based sales really pays off in this moment where there's a lack of confidence somewhere else. The relationship is going to be the key component to it. Many of us want a very easy sales pipeline. Let's change our positioning. Let's blast some people. Let's do some LinkedIn posts or whatever. And what we result to is what I call wallpaper. It's just like pretty pixels out there, making the client look at our wallpaper and they do all the work of figuring out, are you somebody I want to work with? But the those folks that have salespeople that keep the relationships warm and going and deep, those salespeople were able to go deep into the coffers and pull out some big wins in the last month, I think that's pretty awesome. It just goes to show you your sales technique is going to be a very long runway um, if, if this trend continues. And we don't like that, especially when we don't have cash. So it's going to put us into a kind of a spin and it can create a downward spiral if we're so addicted to that cash. We just keep, keep, keep taking the cheap projects and not building up our cash reserves and not building up those relationship reserves. We can find ourselves in some pretty sticky places. Mm. I mean, I remember Jake can always tells me, you know, you, 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 the, the, the pathway to a sale for a client you already got is one month, but the pathway with a new client 
months, at least three months. So I think, you know, as I, if I'm hearing you right, trust matters more to clients. It's not just to us as well. They're nervous. They want to make sure it's done right. So if you're doing right by a client, make sure that they're feeling the love and make sure you're checking in with them. It's interesting you said the word trust. I was having a conversation with a client earlier today and I asked them, hey, what do you think is going to make the biggest difference in your sales this year? And they said trust also. And I thought it was such an interesting word because you know that exercise where like you're standing somewhere, someone else stands behind you and then you let go and you fall into their arms, right? That's called a trust fall. And many of us want to say trust is like re reliability or deliverability or, you know, always meeting the mark. But when you do a trust fall, you actually, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to hand off something to you. I want you to hold on to, this. I'm letting go and you have to catch it. And it, there's a burden lifting that you have to do in trust too. And I think that's what those clients that were getting the big month this year are like, hey, I need to trust you. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to hand my burden off to you and you have to catch it. And I'm going to trust that you can catch it and go. So can you deliver? Yeah, you and your competitors can deliver. But do I have a relationship of trust with you that I can put my burden of possible unemployment on you and you can keep me going and make me look good? Man, that's going to be a bigger, bigger ask than just like, can you deliver on time, on budget? There's a deeper piece of that. So I think the word trust is an interesting one um, uh, that we should be under, considering. It's an underrated word. Have you got any more graphs? Tim, I want to see more data. I want to see more numbers. I want to show you more. Show me data. where we're going. All right. <laughs> All right. So here's the big dashboard. Here's what we often look at when we do our quarterly reports. At RevThink, um, many of you have this engagement with us, but we build quarterly reports for you. And we put these graphs or similar graphs like this into your, your sheet to show you specifically what your trends are. We are then aggregate that to kind of look at mega trends here. So there's some very obvious stuff. Everyone's kind of like leaning into their screen right now. And I'll zoom in in a second so you can see it. But just as a big picture, you can see, look at this stuff goes down, 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 down. And here's revenue by itself. 21, 22 is a little bit higher. We all know it. 23 was a dog. When in 23 is key. Look at if here's the 2023, I'll zoom in here, just um, 150 here. Q4 of 2022 almost gave us like false confidence because when 2023 hit, this drop here is a big drop in just a few short weeks. So this is a nine week cycle and we go from here to here in our, in our reserve and we're slow to respond. We can see that in the numbers. And then look at it, it builds itself back up here. And I really wanna warn you right now, don't look at this <laughs> as a, be careful that you're not looking at another false summit because it feels very much like this is resetting itself back down that 2023 and 2024 have a lot of parallels in Q1. And we're looking at now like, I think Q1 is going to have this another reset here. Now it might not be as big because it's not as high, but we're going to drop down. Um, so that's a one key thing right now we're looking at it for ourselves in revenue is just like what's going to happen really soon. I'm looking forward on people's cash boards for the next few weeks. It's been really amazing what was carried over from December into people's projects. So they're still busy right now. But then when I look, how are we going to replenish this thing? Show me April, show me March, show me late February, you know, weeks that are eight weeks from now, four weeks from now. And we can see some negative cash, cash flow, meaning that, we have to adjust expenses if revenue doesn't come in to make up for that difference. And we're gonna adjust expenses if we have to. Uh, many of us adjust expenses anyways. I'm gonna zoom in here just at one step closer to- um, what, are the, what are the big ways you're seeing where people, are, what are people cutting back on? Yeah, I'm, uh, what's happening here is like, if you look at here, profit drops, obviously with revenue dropping. Oh. So per, just like what you would want is if revenue drops and you're always making 10%, this would be a flat line. But even in 2022 was big, profit, something was eating into our profit. Um, so here's, ex, here's the expense trend, the expense goes up. And inside of the expense trend, there are two major expenses that we have. The first one is our employees. So overall, our employee expenses went up from 21 and 22 and 23. And we know it, people started asking for more money. The COVID process, people had revenue on hand, it felt very competitive. And we started really paying different prices for our employees. And we, we rewarded them for being around 
during the hard time. So that went up. And then the way to make up for that is that we didn't hire freelancers. So any of you right now, freelancers out there wondering what's happening, this is why. Those that stayed loyal to us or we grew our team, we kept them and tried to retain them. And we, we basically cut back on outside expenses because the revenue did drop, so it had to go somewhere. How does this play itself out in, in the overall revenue curve on a quarter by quarter basis? Again, you can see the big drop from late in 22 to early 2023 is the big wow. shift difference. Look at that difference. It's huge, right? Oh my God. That is, that, uh, like I could feel that in my stomach at the time, but that totally visualizing it. Yeah. And that's how, like this, that feeling right there is often why we use graphs because people are saying, uh, they can feel it, right? And I like to say like, well, you know that feeling you have? This is what it looks like with your money. So if you have that feeling again in the future, start realizing, oh, wait, I know what to do. I can start uh, responding sooner to that. But this drop right here is what we've made up for. So again, the drop in revenue. Oh, just a quick expenses. question, Tim. Yeah, go ahead. Got a, got a question from Seth, just saying, um, are you are you accounting for the inflationary curve as well? No. This is basically just straight numbers. So we're not right. offsetting it based off of, or basically it's um, the inflation of prices are being eaten away in profit here. But we didn't do, we're not looking at whole numbers, we're looking at percentages of revenue. And that way we can see it in comparison one-to-one -one from, from agency to agency. Thanks, um, Thanks for asking. Yeah. So we, because revenue was dropping, we made up for it by cutting back expenses. Where do we cut back the expenses? Even though the employees as a percentage of revenue had it had a big drop, but we we were slow to do it. It took us a while to cut back our employees. And interesting, by the time we cut back our employees to a good healthy number, the revenue was actually increasing on us the other way. So we, we had a great Q4. That's why we can pay those accounts payables and make up for it. So we're basically making up we're we're slow to respond, finally get a response, and then freelancers are basically, you know, just being cut out all the way. And I know that I've been doing factors reports with clients, Matt, you've been doing that with them. And yeah. a factors report for those who don't know what it is, it's basically a look forward in your, in your corporate budget and ask the question, what factors will influence your profits at the end of the year. And we program that into your system. We create splits so that we know what portion of revenue should be spent on project expenses and which one should be held back for corporate expenses, or we say creative expenses and company expenses. So that, that split right there is something we can control and look at. It's often why our freelancers stay under control because freelancer control and budgets go hand in hand. And when you have that, you can respond. Employees are much harder to, to bring on and, and get rid of. So that slow employee, um, uh, reflection can kind of eat through a lot of profit too soon. Um, so that's what the numbers are telling me right now. It's like, I'm looking at something that says, hey, you know what? We responded in Q4 to solid employee numbers. If there is a drop right now in Q1, which there is, at least we're not making it up from this point. We didn't rebuild in Q4 when revenue is there. We have a great chance right now to respond and probably many of you are feeling that way. You almost feel like, gosh, this year already sucks, but thank goodness I don't have, you know, extra revenue or extra expenses um, that I did those corrections early on in 2023 and I hated it. That's why we hated 2023. We had to say goodbye to people, adjust. Clients didn't call us. We weren't calling other, our freelancers. That big yucky thing of just working people through the system happened. But now that it's there and it's set, sure, we're kind of living out a dog first quarter, but we had a solid base of our employees. Obvious advice, don't bring on new employees right now. I think that's pretty obvious, right? <laughs> um, and I don't think any of you were planning on it, but we're going to have to ask the question soon. But Matt, how do we grow? If I don't bring on employees and new tech is coming into play and disruptive, um, um, you know, methods are being part of the process. I need to bring some of that new creative uh, energy into my company. 
where does it come from? And if I just freelance it, I don't get to retain that knowledge. I actually don't get to own that part of it. Where am I going to build up my company with this lack of reserve? Um, that's probably like one of the first bigger questions we're asking it, um, for this year. Definitely. I mean, here, here in Australia, there are like below the line grants where you could, the government's actually funding um, mid-level employees for career growth, but, you know, start earmarking the people you want to, you want to grow with and who are important to you. Don't just box them out because you can't just ignore talent when it's sitting in front of you, but yeah, you've definitely got to be cautious and work on those trust with the, with your clients. Like make sure that the ones that are feeding you feel the love and that they know that you're there with them. How can you go the extra mile? What do they need? How can you help them feed you? And if we're going to go into this year with sales in mind, right? That means I got to be willing to walk into any room and pitch my services, explain who we are, be able to back up my capabilities. And I need a creative force behind me, right? So that's what I'm walking into that trust, confidence moment that client's waiting for is can you do it? Do you have the team to handle it? So that that trend right there makes me say, I have to have something in, in my, on my team to make a difference. And I don't have the money to retain my team. We're gonna have a lot of pressure right there. Mm. So we're, we're gonna have to switch how we do sales. I'll go back to the idea of like, short term sales are not gonna help your company right now. You're gonna have to think long term sales, you're gonna have to just I get that you're gonna do short term work, and you need to get that money. And, and but if you're only focusing on the short term for the next two quarters, you're going to miss out on what will, you're going to really need in Q3 and Q4, which are good, solid relationships that they can say, well, now that more disruption is at hand, I need to give you more of my work because I trust you. So you almost need to like really focus on planting those seeds. And it's not a chat bot on LinkedIn is going to get you there. Um, yeah, no, we're going to have it to really know, does. It reframes oh, yeah. sales. Like maybe it's less about the big presentation and bringing the muffins in for all the creatives, but the carefully placed phone call to your prize client, asking them what's on their mind, what do they need, what's going on with their business, trying to start start conversations. Yeah, I did. I posted two things on community last week that were on the top of my mind as I was thinking and looking through this stuff. And one was just this basic question: Where would a new lead come from? And just ask people like, you know, I can't remember how many people responded, 30 people. So decent response of where would, when you think of a new lead, where do you get, where do you get them? A third of the people are saying like, we actually don't, they call us, we don't call them. So that makes me think that you either are, have a strong marketing person uh, presence and people are seeking you out. You've done something unique or something new that they can see uh, that capability and they're curious and they want to engage you. But this is the one for me. It's like no, this 40% connections through current clients. We, we don't depend on this enough when we're building our sales strategy. We, we know our clients, we're going to ask them, you have anything for us? And then we go to straight in our mind, cold leads. Like, how do I, you know, where's a stranger out there, but usually it's one degree of separation. So this, uh, thought process of like, where will my next growth come from? It's a client, it's a connection through one of your existing clients. How do you get to that point? Well, your client has to trust you so that they tell their friend, their colleague, their boss, hey, these guys are really great. They can probably handle more. Let's give them more of the work. And they're going to back that for you. Um, I, I say that because I don't think many of us realize that, that if we're begging too much and asking too much for the short term, you're not developing that confidence and we're missing this possibility of growth through another person, one degree of separation away, instead of this idea, like many of us have, you know, get me in the room, I'll sell it, no problem. Um, I'm so good in the room, just give me that chance. Like, no, let's, let's be really thoughtful about who we are and how that's gonna be presented moving forward. Relationship-based sales is gonna be the answer to 2024, without a doubt. Yeah. Sounds so obvious, but it's not easy to do and it takes time. Yeah. We, we are going to start some small groups. If you haven't heard that or seen that posted, there are small groups forming starting next week. If you have already showed interest, we sent you a survey to make sure that we chose the right path for small group. There's some people that want to talk about just live action. There's, some, there's an APAC group, Matt, for people that are in a different time zone. 
But one of the bases of the small groups that many people asked is like, how do we find a new client base? So we're going to talk about relationship-based sales early on in the small group. Small groups format, just so you know, is like, it's just a six month commitment to that small group. And we're going to work through some cycles together. We're going to kind of get to some hands-on stuff. It will be eight to 12 people pods in there. So each small group might have a different dynamic or different book that they're reading, but we're going to guide those small groups through the process. And I think that that early focus on relationship-based sales and what people are asking for is accountability through the small groups. I think we can kind of buck some trends. I want the, I want the people in the small group to tell me at the end of 2024, man, that made all the difference to be the first half of the year, having my butt kicked by other owners, like making sure I was getting that stuff done and slowing down and giving me confidence and giving me the feedback on that pitch so that I, I wasn't just in my own panic mind, making all these bad decisions. Um, yeah. That's my goal way for too, that, the small group in there. Oh, totally. And it's way too easy to pretend you're doing this stuff. You got to be doing it every week. Every week. Yeah. If you're interested in small groups, you can just DM me or you can look at the posts and just put your name there. Eric will reach out to you with that survey. Make sure you're choosing the right group to fit into. And we're gonna have two meetings next week to launch them. One in the APAC time zone. So all of you on the Asia Pacific realm that we have to wake up early to get some of the stuff done. We'll keep that going. And then we'll do some, uh, something more suitable to like the Eastern time zone. Um, and that kickoff um, next week, we'll just to descri describe the format, everyone knows it. And then we'll break up into the small groups that is um, right after that. So you'll know which seven other to 10 other people you're gonna be in a group with. Sounds exciting. And um, we've got one last comment from Patrick here who says, Note that the work available left in the market, it's the top studios getting the small, the good stuff, the smallest and price competitive studios get some breadcrumbs in the middle is the toughest at the moment. What do you, how yeah. do you feel about that, Tim? Yeah. And I talked to Patrick earlier today too. There is, that's what we were seeing is that at the bottom in there, the, where we're, I would call them freelancers, but smaller studios also, they're, they're kind of getting the leftovers where many times when you're a smaller studio coming up, you're using other agencies, other people's projects to build up your, your reel, to get into new relationships, kind of like, I'll call it the coattail process of like writing someone else's coattail until you can stand on your own. It's a really great tactic to get there. Today, it's like everyone's in survival mode. So, you know, the lifeboat is only so big, who's going to sit on that lifeboat? So specifically, we're talking about this with Patrick too, is like, yeah, but don't you know something different as a small business? Like, can you be nimble when other people are being big? You should just use your, you know, your mightiness, whatever that is, to your benefit. There might be other ways of getting things done. And I'm looking at Seth right now. because so I talked to Seth, with Seth um, yesterday about his process of going through sales and a lot of analytical um, method that he does to get to the bottom line of who's buying and how. Um, and that process of like diving into some of that stuff as a small business owner that you can do that the larger businesses have to kind of like, you know, keep the projects moving. And so they slow down in their sales cycle. A smaller business can um, be more relational and have less burden on them. So we're just going to use the strength we have this year to get through. Um, but I do know this, we can do it together. That's why the community is strong. That's why many of you um, are sharing this information, um, making the community stronger and, I think Matt and I feel very lucky that we get to be part of that process. And in the, in the middle market, like I'd always look for those maverick marketers, look for those, like there are people who want to do things nimbly and want to cut through the quick and want to do things without 16 rounds of approval. Look for those people who are ninjas like you and show them that you're their best secret weapon. Like there, there are advantages of being more than two people and less than 20. Yeah. You can be nimble. You can take on the new technology. You could be the missing creative element that some people, people are looking for. I know one place in New York right now that's thinking, should we merge? Should we acquire smaller agencies in order to keep up with the creative forces that are taking place? Because they've been larger for a while and they can't necessarily, they need to infuse some of that growth. So I think you, there's a lot of opportunity and leverage um, if you're smaller. You just need to know how to position yourself in that conversation so that they can know where to buy you and how it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Tim. That's exciting. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's so great to see you all. If you have any other questions, we can continue this conversation on to community. I'll post um, this video out there so that other people can see it. But any questions that you have, you can DM or just make the comments there, fill in some of the blanks for others. 
I think there's a lot to share right now. If you're willing to put yourself out there and share how your Q1's looking so that everyone's kind of getting a perspective of, are they one of those unicorns that might have a false confidence that you have a million dollar month every month that, that right? They, they already know that that's, that's not going to happen, but the sense that where, where are the trends and how they, how do they work out? You know, you're all working this out together. So um, let's use the community for that purpose. And Matt, thanks for always being there. I appreciate it. My pleasure. We're better together. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks for turning up. Um, if you don't know this, we exist so that you can thrive in your business life and career. And today we're talking a lot about business. So um, but anything we can do to help you focus on that, um, we are available to you. Um, thanks for being part of this at the weekly briefing. And we'll see you all next week. Have great days. Thanks, Tim.